back here again uh, to serve you. Amen. Okay, praise the Lord. Yes, today everybody is here, so I move here a little bit. Is that okay? All right, okay, so, um, <laughs> and, uh, okay, let me get this working. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, yeah. Okay, and I'm um, so glad to be back here again. And um, today I'm very honored once again to be back here. Thank you, Pastor Shu and uh, X Leadership for having me back here to share the word. Today I want to share, and I know that the theme today is on grace. And uh, these two weeks you've been sharing, you've been hearing about the grace of God. I want to share with you uh, something that has encouraged me a lot during the time that we and our church needed the most grace. I thought it was... This, this passage that I will share with you today has blessed me a lot sometime in the end of 2015. And that was exactly the period that... Uh, that was the time where we were in the midst of the trial going on in our church. Personally, in, on staff, it was very unstable. There were lots of things happening. Why? Because there were court cases and there were certain major court hearings that were going on and the verdict and all that stuff was supposed to happen. And it was a pretty emotional, pretty uh, chaotic and unpredictable and very uncertain period. And I, and I know and I understand from your leadership that you, you might be going through something together as a church. I want to share this with you because this has, this has encouraged me a lot. And it was actually through this passage that the Lord refreshed me spiritually and I found the grace to keep on going on in Christian ministry, in my Christian life and staying strong for God. And the things that I got out of John 2 verse 1 to verse 11, you never, it, I, I never read this passage like that. And what I want to share with you is I believe that the same grace that has enabled myself, at least personally, that same grace will be upon all of you and upon the entire congregation to go through this period of time and emerge greater, more victorious, and you're able to continually give thanks to God. And it will always just go from glory to glory. So be encouraged. So let me begin by reading to you from John 2, verse 1 to verse 11. And it is, this passage is about the wedding feast. It's the first miracle that Jesus performed in the Gospel of John. And I pray that it will bring you encouragement. So let me read this to you. And this is a familiar passage that most of us here, if we have gone through church, one way or another, you would have heard this. You would have came across this passage. Now, like, like many of you, I also have come across this passage many, many times. But just at this point in time, it, it hit me in a very different way. So allow me to share this with you today. It says that on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding and they ran out of wine. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. His mother then said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there was set there six water pots of stone, of according uh, six water pots of stone according to the manner of purifications of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And he, they took it. When the master of the feast has tasted the water that has been made that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let us pray. Father, we just 
Thank you, Father, for this Sunday afternoon. Lord, we thank you that your presence is here. Holy Spirit, be with us today. Be our guide, be our teacher. Lord, be the revealer of your word. Holy Spirit, I pray, make the word come alive. Lord, that it will bring encouragement. It will bring edification, Father, to every person here in this place. Lord, you know what is going on in our personal life. You know what is going on personally, uh, corporately. So, Father, we want to commit our lives. Father, we, I want to thank God for Acts Baptist Church. And Lord, we want to commit the rest of the time to you. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen? Now, as I say, this would have been a very familiar verse to you. And I want to add a statement before I go on. Would you believe that the entire gospel is already in the 11 verses that I read to you? Hold that thought. Why is the gospel in this 11th passage? Now, many like us, my, myself, I read this passage many times. And most of the time, to be very frank, to be very honest, I read this passage without much thought. Because I'm even guilty of saying to myself, what is the big deal of this miracle? What is the big deal of Jesus changing water into wine? Why did God, or why did the Son of God decide to act like some street magician and not only he sounded like a street magician, he was kind of rude to his own mother? Well, these were my two afterthoughts. But how wrong can I be? So let me explain why this miracle is so much, so much more. Have you known that Weddings or a marriage are very special events to God. The Bible began with the wedding in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2. And the Bible end with, ends with the wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19. Now Jesus repeatedly calls himself the bridegroom and the church, that is you and I, his bride. Now, choosing to do his first miracle at a wedding event definitely holds tremendous significance for the ministry of our Lord and our Savior. Understand that this is one of the first miracles, the first miracle that John recorded for us to know God, as for us to know Jesus as the Son of God. So John said, this is the first miracle. Now, John chose Eight miracles that pointed to Jesus as the Son of God. And this is the first miracle. Why was this miracle recorded for us? Now, my friends, the ancient Middle Eastern wedding was a big deal. Just like today, every wedding is a big deal, especially for the bride and the bridegroom, the one getting married, their immediate family. Now, even more so in the Middle Eastern culture and custom. Weddings are a big deal, not just for the bride and the groom, not just for their families, but it was for the extended family and the community around them. You know, everybody will be invited, everybody will be involved. Now, each wedding was a public feast for the whole town. It would be the most significant event for the lives of the bride and groom. That was it. That for the bride and the groom, this, where the wedding for them would have been the most significant event in their lives. This was the time where, you know, everybody's invited and, and they were the stars in the wedding. Now, did you realize that first and foremost, this, the incident happened on the third day of the feast. Remember? Three days into the feast. Now, you must understand that these weddings, unlike ours, they last about a week. Okay, so the celebration goes on Monday, Tuesday. The you know, celebration goes on for seven days. Seven days of feasting and celebration. Now, if you notice over here, this incident happened on the third day of the feast. Third day. Doesn't that sound very special to you? On which day did Jesus resurrect? On the third day. You see, first and foremost, there's already a clue to tell you it is very special. Now, the other thing that we need to understand that in every wedding, quite similar to ours, 
there was something that you cannot do without. You need this because this is what we call the, the thing that makes every party kick. They need wine. Okay? And especially more so in the Middle Eastern wedding, there is wine. And wine, you know, rep- is, is, is significant to God. Now, I'm not talking about being drunk. I'm talking about the, the wine. And, 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 and over here, in, on the third day, the bride and the groom ran out of wine, the single most important element in any parties. You see, you must understand that when the wine runs out, the party stops. And if the party ever stops, this was a breach of social etiquette and it will be a social disgrace for both the bride and the bridegroom and their family. No wine, no party, no fun. Disgrace. It will be a humiliating for them to come before their guests and to tell them, sorry, we run out of wine. Now, did you know that what happened here, not for anything, the Lord rescued the wedding. They didn't even know. They didn't even know that they ran out of wine. But the Lord, not, not for anything, not for anything, just, just reading this and having a better context, not for anything, the Lord rescued the wedding. You see, He rescued the wedding celebration, even without the bride and the groom knowing that He did. But there is so much more. Because, you know, sorry, this was the, when, and, and that is, this, this is the, this is the thing that holds significance, right? Now, the key verse is actually in verse 11, because John recorded and said, John said, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believe him. Now, when we read this, we must ask ourselves, why? Why did John record this? How was the glory of Jesus, how was the glory of God manifested? And not only that, the disciples begin to believe in Him as the Son of God. Why? Why this street magic? It, it can't be just something that Jesus did and He turned water into wine. Abracadabra, it becomes wine, and then, the, and, then the, and then the disciples begin to believe in him. Well, there is so much more, as I say. Consider launching a business. Consider setting up a shop. In every case, it is logical and prudent that in my first public presentation to the people, to my customers, the first showcase must be the best. Every detail what I say, how I say, what to do, how I do it, will convey the message behind the branding that I hope to bring to watch my customers. And so, the first miracle that Jesus did and was recorded for us must be significant, must be special, and special it is. Why would Jesus use his supernatural powers to turn water into wine, to sustain the festivities or the party. Why didn't he choose, why can't I heal the sick? Why can't I part the sea, feed the thousands, walk on water, raise the dead? Why did all these other seemingly bigger, more uh, showing, more powerful miracles, why did Jesus choose turning water into wine? That was my question as well. Why did he choose this? Why did he choose turning water into wine? Now, you, ha- you have to understand, the word is over there. This is the sign. A sign is not the destination, but the sign points us to the destination. So when I come to Ex Baptist Church, I look at the signs along the expressway. You know, Taloblanga, whatever, ECP. I look at the sign. The sign is not the destination, but I follow the signs leading to my destination. How does this miracle point to Jesus as our Savior? So let's understand why this miracle 
is such a big deal. Why this turning water into wine is such a big deal. And I said to you, follow me. When you read this carefully, the entire gospel is in this miracle. Let me show you why. Number one, I want you to understand. First and foremost, Jesus came to bring us joy. Oh, this is so important. In verse 9, we are introduced to the master of the banquet. He was essentially a kind of master of ceremonies, which we call today. The, the MC or the EMC or whatever you call him, some sort of presider. It says that when the master of the feast has tasted the water that was made wine, you know, he told the host, why did you bring out the good wine later? You know? So in every event or in every party, there's a master of ceremony. Okay? Now, his job, the MC's job, was to organize the people to ensure that the event was flowing well. He had to be the center of the party, calling all the shots. And it was his job, whether the party is success, whether the party is boring, whether the party is um, you know, good or bad, it all depended on the MC, right? If you have a boring MC, then it's very boring. If you have a, you know, you go to the wedding, right? Sometimes you fall asleep, but if the MC can tell joke and all that kind of stuff, then it's a, it's a memorable wedding. You see, so when Jesus turned the water into wine, wine is always a symbol of joy. In Proverbs, the Bible tells us that wine, God gave us wine to make your heart glad. Wine is a symbol of joy. Now, when Jesus turned water into wine and saved the day, really, he was telling you and I, I am the true master of the banquet because I came to bring joy to you. And those who believe in me now, right now, and if you are a believer in the Lord, all of us over here, you can experience joy and a foretaste of the joy that I'm going to bring to you when we meet one day. My friends, why joy? Why is joy so important? As a pastor, I have the privilege, and I call it a privilege, to go behind the scenes. And I go and visit many sick people. I have the privilege to be there when a family member dies or is dying and to just be with my members as the loved one pass on. I have the privilege to go and pray for my members who are down with terminally ill sicknesses. I have the privilege of being in the front line to sometimes see relationship breakdown in the marriage, in the family, financial bankruptcy, and I get to see the effects of poverty, imprisonment, drugs, and its destructive power on people. And ultimately, one of the things that I dread, so I dread seeing is the death of young children and babies. And these are things that goes on in our broken down world. And now I begin to understand, life indeed has not been easy. Many of us go through and we struggle and we toy with these things in our lives. But as a believer, I want you to be comforted, refresh and revive in, your, in the hard and dry times that you can find the courage to move on. Why? Because when you have invited the Lord into your life, He wants to fill it with joy. The Christian life is not meant to be a life that is sad and Difficult or yes, I'm not saying that it's not difficult. In the fallen world that we live in, things are not easy. But do you know that the first thing that God wants to bring to you and I is joy? Why? Because we can believe in Him. He wants to fill your life with joy and hope amidst all the hopelessness and the gloom in the world. That is why the psalmist writes, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. When I understand this, I know that my walk with God is not meant to be so hard, difficult, serving God is hard and that, but that God has given me the joy to keep on going on in life. This is so important for us. And God knows. It's not even other needs. God wants to give you joy. And for all of us here, we 
are privileged. We are candidate because God is in your life and He wants to bring joy in your life. The truth is that many of us can give testimony of how God has broken through for you. For some, we are still awaiting our promises, awaiting healing, awaiting the breakthrough. Yet, the promise, the Lord promised that the end goal for everyone is joy. Do you know why? He says in Isaiah 25 verse 8, He says, He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away every tears from all faces. The rebuke of His people He will take away from the earth for the Lord has spoken. What a wonderful promise that every tear will be wiped away. We as Christians, we have the greatest hope. We have the greatest hope because we have God. And we have the hope for a great future for every one of us. The first miracle, Jesus says, my first miracle is to set everyone laughing. This is wonderful news. But there is more. Let's move on. The second thing, Jesus came in this miracle. Now it gets more exciting. I want you to know Jesus came to take away our sins. Now we all know that. But how is it shown in this miracle? I want to show you that everything here was very symbolic and very significant. Now there were six, there were set there six water pots of stone according to the man of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim and he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. See, Jesus, I told you, Jesus saved the wedding when he did this miracle. What did he do? He asked them to fill up the jar and then in, a, in, in, in his words, by his words, the water turned into wine. These jars contain water that was used by the Jews for what? Ceremonial washing. Now, this ceremonial washing was a Jewish thing and we know in the Old Testament, in Judaism, it contains a great number of rituals and regulation and, and, and the water in these pots were meant for cleansing, purification. Now, you ask yourself, why? Why cleansing? Why purification? Why? Because God is holy and perfect and we are flawed and fallen and in order for you and I, in the Old Testament, they believe that in order for us to approach God and come before God, we have to, we need atonement, we need cleansing and pardon of our sins. So in the Old Testament, the people conducted many ceremonies and rituals and blood sacrifices to make atonement and cleanse themselves of their sin before they approached the throne room of God. Now, when Jesus chose to use the jars normally used for ceremonial washing, He is really saying to you and I, I will accomplish what these ceremonial rituals will do for you. In other words, I am the one that will cleanse you of your sin. To fully understand this, we have to understand and to be reminded of our sinful nature. Now, once again, I'm not trying to be sin conscious over here, but I want us to understand the fallen state of the human race, you know, and see, we all know deep down inside there is sin. I've got to be very direct. No offense, I, I, I'm talking about myself. This is not to shame you or to make you feel lousy, but because I am very aware of my fallen nature. I'm very aware that I'm still a work in progress, moving on to becoming more Christ-like. I'm also very aware of my, the personal self-centeredness inside of me. I know that deep down inside, no one needs to teach me how to think bad. No one needs to teach a kid how to say lie. No one, because things that come out from the kid's mouth, the first thing is no, not yes. You know, have you ever wondered why? Alright, no one needs to teach us how to do naughty things or, or to lust or to think about evil. No one teaches us how to be lazy or, you know. And, and for that matter, why do we seek to strive in life? There's always a need to prove that we are right. We are so concerned about our face. We seem to need to prove ourselves right. Why all the insecurities? Why the pride, the ego, the sickness, the broken down relationship? Why the pain? Why the wars? Why all the big disasters and crises? These are the effects of sin in our fallen world. And it doesn't really get better. The Lord reminded us, the Bible, the Word reminds us that the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? In a way, all of us, just like Adam and Eve, 
many times we've been trying to cover up. To cover up for all the inadequacies inside of us, Adam and Eve started with fig leaves, but fig leaves don't last. And today we try to cover up our flaws, our insecurities with prestige, status, striving, trying to prove myself right. See, I'm right. Even when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the first thing they did was to cover up. Consider the possibility that our success and wealth and achievement in life is just one big fig leaf. I want to propose to you, we all need to be cleansed. We all need our sins removed. You can deny it all you want, but we need it. We need our sins removed. The best news that Jesus brought over here, he told, he told us, and by doing that, he's saying, I came to remove your sin. The guilt and the shame in our lives can be permanently removed and in place. There is peace, freedom, reconciliation, and assurance when we are in Christ. This miracle is significant. The last time, if you can remember, when did God turn water into blood? It was with Moses in Egypt. And when he turned the water and now into blood, that was a curse. And because of that, that left to so much death. But now, in the second miracle from the Son of God, he did exactly that same miracle. But this time round, this miracle was not a curse. It was a blessing to every one of us. Because one day, his blood will cleanse us of our sins. Last but not the least, in order for Jesus to remove the sins in our lives, He has to come to die for us. In order for Him to remove the sins in our life, He came to die for us. Now this is where it gets very interesting. Because let us look at what Jesus said. And as I say, everything uttered from the mouth of God it's not flimpingly done, but it always means something. It's not something that, that, like us, we sometimes say things that have no meaning or there is no significance. Now, everything Jesus said and everything was, was recorded about him has significance. Now, how do we know that he came to die for us? As I told you, it's a sign that will point to something he's going to do for us. Now, so what happened over here? Now, look at this part over here. This is where it gets very interesting. Now, this is the phrase that I struggled with a lot because he said, Jesus said to her, Mary, the mother, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come. What an interesting remark. What was on the mind of Jesus? Now, Mary went to tell Jesus, right? Hey, we got a problem. The bride and bridegroom, no more wine. Jesus. But, Instead, when she asked for help, she got a rather rude response. Now, however, I thank God, Mary was cool. Thank God for, for the mother of Jesus. Now, Mary might not have exactly understand what, why Jesus responded in such a way, but being his mother, she must have perceived something and that he was no ordinary man. Do you know she did very smart? She did not argue. She did not ask him. She did not walk away and say, you so rude, son. Why are you so rude? And then she walked away. Do you know she was very good? She told and turned to the servants. She did not react. She simply turned to the servants and said, do whatever he tells you to do. Now, this is really good advice. If the Lord tells you something, just do it. Don't have to think. If you know you heard from the Lord, just do it. Now, so Jesus made this quote, quote, disrespectful reply to her. You know, it's like, she said, woman, it's not even like mommy or mom. You know, it's like, if you ask me, sorry, in Hokkien, it's, you know, it's like, it's very rude. You know, it's like telling you, you know, what's the problem, you know, and uh, why, you, why you bring this problem to me? It's, you know, it seems rather harsh and he's not answering the question. But, 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 Look, as I say, everything recorded 
from God's mouth, from the Lord's mouth, is something significant. Now, the question we have to ask is this. Why did he make this statement? What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come. Now, having said this, I want you to go into the mind of Jesus. What exactly was on his mind? You must know, he's obviously thinking about something. He was there at the wedding. What was he thinking about? You see, now, again, as a pastor, I have the privilege to conduct uh, weddings, you know. And uh, of course, I prefer weddings to funeral, right? You know, and weddings um, are very joyous occasions, and I love to be at weddings. And uh, over in my church, we, we have many weddings. And so every time I go to a wedding, I, I have the chance to observe what goes on in a wedding. I observe two kinds of people in wedding. First and foremost, I observe the first group. They are the married couples like myself. Okay? So when I receive the wedding invitation, I will say, oh no, another hong zha tan. I would say, oh man, this is another red bomb. But of course, I'm very happy for my member, you know. But, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's like a big red bomb to me. And I say, wow, you know, because in, in Singapore, it's getting more and more expensive to attend a wedding. And, 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 and really, we want to bless every couple. We don't want them to make losses. So, so every time I receive an invitation, we also want to bless them and make sure they do not make losses. And, and for me, it's like, oh, okay, which hotel, you know, and how much is it? And okay, this is like the response of the married people. Sorry, maybe not for you, but for me. There's another group of people that I respond. They are what we call the singles. Those people that have not yet got married. Okay? Now, especially, you know, in my church, we always have, and I think similarly in yours, you always have friends to help you. So, they are what we call the entourage team. They are the aku and the tieme, you know. So, they have both the boy side and the girl side. Now, now, now these people, they, they are very interesting. And, and, and I must commend them because they serve so hard, so willingly, so they, they follow the bride and groom throughout the whole day, you know. And, and they really dress up and, and help the wedding entourage. They go through all the funny activities in the morning when the groom goes and receives the bride. And, and, and sometimes I look at this group of people, I, um, you know, I, I, I always look at them and I said, hey, what is on their minds? So I catch them when they are sitting over there at the table, when they are going through the wedding. Now let me, let me say something. Now they are not concerned about Ang Pao and whatever, Hong Zha Tan or whatever. Now what is on their minds? You see, on their minds, I'm very sure they are thinking about these things. For example, they will say, hey, how is my own wedding going to be like? Because they are the Aku and the and, and the Jemei, right? So, so when they do their wedding, on their mind, now, if you ever do that on your mind, you'll be thinking, hey, my own wedding, how uh, is it going to be like that? Now, they also will be thinking, you know, hey, what will I be wearing? Maybe in their mind, they will say, wow, oh, actually the bright, the bright, uh, the dress are so ugly, but I know that to say, okay, I will never wear that, okay, or whatever. So on their mind, they'll be thinking like that. Oh, 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 they will say, you know, uh, 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 where, where will I hold my wedding? You know, I know this place that I've gone to is so beautiful. So we've gone to many premises, or oh, this hall is wow, beautiful. Or oh, this hall is the other one, so china, or whatever, you know. So they go to different places and they'll say, I, I think that in the single's mind, they will be thinking like, how would I have my own wedding? You know, how, what am I gonna wear? How is my wedding going to be like? Is it going to be like this wedding? Now, I want to propose to you. I want to say something. Please don't get me wrong. You know, what was on the Lord's mind? Jesus was a single. I want to say something. Jesus was thinking about his own wedding. Now, don't get me wrong, okay? I'm not preaching heresy. Now, I know Jesus never got wed- got. Got, got married, but look, 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 there was a wedding on the Lord's mind. Which wedding? This wedding. Who wrote it? The same author, John. Now, what was this wedding about? Look, Revelations chapter 19, I told you, this is the end. This is the end. It started in Genesis chapter 2. Now it ends in 
Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 to verse 9, it says what? Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then He said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. You know, you know when he wrote over here, when John recorded, when he had this vision of this marriage supper, you know, it's like a double confirmation. It's like God tell him, tell him, write, write it down because it's going to happen. It's chopped and it's confirmed. Write it down because it's going to happen. Now, so John understood and, and when he had the revelation, he says there was the ultimate marriage of the lamb, marriage of the lamb has come. And the wife, the church, has made herself ready. And it was granted to her, clean and bright, fine linen, because they are the righteous acts of the saint. We are made righteous because Jesus took away our sins. Then he says, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you know that this is how we're going to end with the Lord? We will come and participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the end times, this will be the feast or the ultimate party for all of us. It, is, it will be the wedding feast to celebrate the intimate and permanent union of God, Jesus, the bridegroom, with the church, that's us, the bride. Permanent, we are coming together to be with the Lord forever. This isn't this what you and I long and wish and hope to? That God will come back and He will reign and rule over us? This will be our ultimate joy. Do you know, and I tell you, that this wedding, when Jesus went to the wedding, He was thinking about His own wedding. And this really moved Jesus. The Bible tells us that God does not want to simply relate to us as kings and subjects or shepherd and sheep only and not even father and children, but groom and bride. Speaking, ex expressing the greatest intimacy of relationship, husband and wife. Jesus keeps calling us, we are his bridegroom. Jesus was looking all the way into the future and he saw this event. And the current event, the current wedding that he was in must have reminded him of this big event that is going to be in the future. And, 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 so, and so he made this command. He said, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Why did Jesus say, my hour has not yet come? What does this mean? My friends, do you know that my hour, the word hour, is what? It's always referring to the hour of his death, the occasion of his death. John 7 verse 30, John 8 verse 20, John 12 verse 23, the hour always refers to the hour of his death. Mary told him they need wine for the wedding. And then he says, it is not my time to die yet. Why would a simple question associate Jesus with his death? Really, this earthly wedding, this wedding that he was in, reminded him of his own future wedding with us. Jesus says, I have come to this world to bring joy. And one day, to be reunited with my people, us, in marriage, in heaven. But he says, Mother, I am going to have to die for them. I, for that wedding, for the revelation wedding, for the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Lord is saying, I, in order for that to happen, I will have to die for you. I will have to die in order for that to happen. I will have to die for them in order that the future wedding can take place. To ever make the wedding supper of the Lamb happen, Jesus is saying, I will have to die for them. Not now, but soon. I will have to shed my blood. I'm going to be rejected, separated from the Father. 
and I'm going to lay down my life for them. For who? For you, for me, for all our loved ones who have yet to be saved. The shedding of my blood will cleanse them and it will be a blessing to all who believe. For my people to ultimately drink the cup of joy and eternal life. That is why Jesus says the cup, wine. Wine is always joy. For us to drink the cup of joy and eternal life, I will have to drink the cup of justice and punishment. And that was the thing that the Lord struggled before God the Father. He says, if we can, can this cup be passed from me? Can this cup, can I not drink the cup? But nonetheless, your will be done. Thank God. Very soon, two years down the road, the Lord indeed went to the cross, took the cup of justice and punishment on our behalf and He went through the hour so that you and I can one day partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. I told you, the gospel is here. Jesus came and did it for us. In conclusion, Philippians 2, verse 5 to verse 8. Musicians, maybe can you gently play for me at the background. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Wow! Wow! The Son of God. Who was God? Love us, His church. That even while we were sinners, He gave up His rights, relinquished all that was rightfully belonged to Him, relinquished His possession, His privileges, His glory, His status, His authority, His power. Gave it all up, lost it all, left heaven left the Father, came in the likeness of man, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant, humbled himself, led a lonely and a rather misunderstood life and obeyed to die a most terrible, shameful, painful death of Roman crucifixion. Romans 5 verse 6 to verse 8 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated His lone love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What amazing grace. Such a grace that saved a wretched man like me. All for one. All so that you and I can one day be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. What amazing grace. Did we deserve it? Did we earn it? Did we ever think that we are qualified for the marriage supper of the Lamb? No. He did it because of grace. He did it because of you, me, and many more yet to come into the kingdom can one day partake of the final wedding supper of the Lamb. Son of God, who was God, so loved us that He gave His life, surrendered in submission to the Father because of His love for us, so that all who believe in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. This blew my mind. The grace of our Saviour the love of our Saviour. What did I do to ever believe in this? What did I do to deserve this? Well, I didn't deserve anything. But He loved us so much and He laid down His life to die for us. What amazing grace. 
And when I began to meditate and think about this, it brought tremendous encouragement to my own life. I say nothing is, should be too difficult for me to go through. If I keep on knowing what the Son of God did for me, so that I can one day be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I will be there with my loved ones, with friends, with all who call upon the Lord as a Savior. I want to end with two things. I want to encourage you this coming Christmas to invite your loved ones to church, to invite your loved ones so that they too can one day partake of the wedding supper of the Lamb together with us. But on a more personal note today, and on a more personal note today, I want you to meditate. I want you to remember that we have a good, faithful, and righteous Savior. Today, He wants to fill your heart with joy. A Christian life, Jesus says, my yoke is light. My yoke is gentle. My burden is light. My yoke is gentle. Come to me, all who are weary, heavily laden. And I really believe that today, even as you go through the challenges in life, even as we go through life with unfulfilled promises, with unhealed sicknesses, with things that we have not seen a breakthrough, knowing what Jesus did for us will give us the strength and the grace to continue walking with Him. Today, why don't we stand to our feet and let's worship Him today because I believe that God wants to restore joy to many of us over here. God wants to restore joy. God knows your heart. God knows what you're going through. I do not know, but God knows. And He wants to restore you. He wants to restore all of us today. Today, why not we sing together? Help me to worship together. And let's sing, Great is our God. Just begin to worship Him today. Hallelujah. the Lord and most worthy of praise, the city of our God, the holy place, the joy of all oh, to live your name on high and Lord we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives and Lord trust in your unfailing love for you alone are God eternal throughout earth and heaven above from the beginning together and great is the Lord and most worthy of praise the city of our God the Holy Land the joy of the Lord, we want to thank you for the 
works here done in our lives And Lord, we trust in your unveiling love For you alone are God eternal Throughout earth and heaven And Lord, we want to live your name on high And Lord, we want to thank you For the words we have done in our lives And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love For you alone are God eternal Throughout earth and heaven And Lord, we want to live your name on high And Lord, we want to thank you for the words you've done in our lives And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love For you alone are God eternal Throughout earth and heaven above As I say today, the Lord wants to restore joy And God wants to restore joy to all of you here in this congregation. Every eye closed and every head bowed. Nobody looking around. If you say, God, I need you so much. Yes, I'm going through a difficult patch. I'm not sure. Maybe prayers are not answered. But I want you to know what amazing grace that God has shown us. And He will give you the grace to go through your life. Today you say, God, I want your joy back into my life. I want a portion of your joy. You came to give us joy. You did not just came to save us, but you came to give us joy. Because as Christians, we are the people with the greatest hope. You came for us so that we can partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. What amazing grace. So many, many more will join us. But today, God wants to restore joy in our life. If that is you, maybe you're weary, tired, Maybe you're asking for something. It's not come to pass. Today God wants to come and fill your heart with joy once again. If that is you, I just want to invite you to lift up your hands. I want to pray for you today. If that is you at the count of three, just lift up your hands. I want to pray for you. And we're going to worship God. And I want you to reach out to God. One, two, three. Just lift up your hands. Nobody looking around. Between yourself and God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we come before you today. What amazing grace. Oh Lord, what amazing grace. What amazing love. Lord, that you will give up everything up. Lord, just come for us. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. That you die for us so that our sins are cleansed. So that we are reunited with you forever. And God, today we come before you. And we lift up our burdens. We lift up our hearts. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, that's going through a tough patch in life. Unanswered prayer, uncertainty, sicknesses. Lord, I just pray, come fill us with your joy. Father, release your grace that we might find strength, that we might find strength to push on and move on. And Lord, our strength is in you, God. Our joy is in you, God. Lord, that you are truly the Lord of the Supper, God. Lord of the Feast, Father. Lord, we ask that you come and you minister to every single person here to lift up their hands. Move in our lives. Father, I pray that even as we begin to worship and reach out to you, minister to us and heal our hearts, Father. Lord, I just pray for this entire congregation. Father, fill every one of us here. Fill them up here with joy, with the joy of the Lord, because it is yours. It's the joy of the Lord. Your strength is our joy. Your strength is our joy, God. Oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. All of us, we worship. Let's worship God together one more time. Amen. Wherever you are. And Lord. And Lord. Is the Lord and most worthy of praise? City of our God, the holy place. The 
joy of the whole world. And great is the Lord who we have the victory. He aids us against the end. Thank you for the works you have done in our lives. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal, true out of and heaven. And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you. For the works you've done in our lives, and Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal, true on earth and heaven above. Lord, I pray the love of the Father, or the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the communion of the Spirit be upon all of us here from this day, Father, to days to come. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and every person say, every all of us say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you.